right, so let's uh, get started with our, we're uh, hopefully, like I said, going to finish up Christian symbols today. And we're starting with uh, uh, number 11. And uh, we had talked briefly about uh, number 10, the cross and the crown. Actually, I should review 10 because, uh, so so what is, what is a crown all about? Yeah, as the king, right? And and that's about the dominion I was just talking about, that he is the ruler over all the earth, over all God's creation. But what does a good king do? What's a dominion for? Be a good leader for the people. Yeah, a good leader for the people. And to defend, you know, a good king defends his people from enemies, and a good king provides for his people as far as all the things that they need and helps facilitate the economy and every I mean make life better for his people right the best he can and to defend from the enemies and that's what a good king does right that's what dominion is all about um, but what's so why why is there a cross in this uh, symbol and why is a cross uh, part of the you know, uh, this symbol for Christ the King. That's, for, that's the place he actually, that's the event that, that begins the saving of us. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's how he does his kingly thing. That's how he defeats the enemies of sin and death. And that's how he provides for his people salvation and that he uh, rescues us out of death and mm -hmm. gives us life cross right so so these are both symbols of Christ's dominion and uh, that's a key concept in the scriptures that I really kind of have discovered more and more especially in the, working in the book of Daniel but so in our Sunday morning Bible class we talked about that uh, how uh, dominion is so key for Daniel but it's that vision of in chapter 7 the you know, basically the the vision that kind of governs the whole book of Daniel is that God gives all authority in heaven and on earth this dominion to this person like the Son of Man who we know is Jesus. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can pour some in mine. That would be great. Thank you. And, uh, and the, the reason for that dominion is so that he can be a savior for his people and to rule over God's kingdom. So you're saying when he says pick up your cross and follow me, that really meaning to follow his ways and resist the ways of the world. Yeah, yeah, pick up your cross. So a cross is a symbol of suffering too, and, and so I'm glad you brought that out that it's Christ's uh, suffering, uh, but also ours too, to mean, you know, go in my way and not your own way of, of sin. And uh, Jesus' way, what the cross means, is he gave up. And this is also part of my uh, presentation, if you watch that, at the LCMS Center. What does what does Christ do in his dominion? Well, first he, he receives that dominion by submitting to the Father and saying, You are my God, you are my Lord and Master. I'm under your uh, dominion, O God. And by submitting then he, uh, he, because he puts himself in the lowest place, then he can come and rescue and save us and lift us up uh, to his place. And so God exalts him because he humbles himself. God exalts him to the highest place and gives him the name that is above every name. That the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Those words sound familiar? And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, right? That's dominion uh, talk. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the master over everything. Um, but because he first submitted, then he can uh, be exalted. But submission is he submitted himself. Uh, St. Paul said, uh, he, even though he's equal with God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. To, but he made himself nothing. He emptied himself and took the form of a servant, a slave of all. He took the lowest place, even 
death on a cross, right? The lowest, the lowest you can possibly go uh, is dying in shame on a cross, as a criminal on a cross. That's, you know, the scriptures teaching. That's as low as you can get. Okay, so uh, that that's a. I mean, that one symbol, just the cross and the crown, there's all that stuff in there. I mean, it tells a story, right? And, uh, and so it's really the whole story of the Bible, the whole story of Jesus Christ and who He is and what He's done for us. All right, so next one we have a lamp. And uh, so, so maybe that's a a little bit easier. Uh, uh, so tell me what uh, what's going on with that? Why? What is a lamp? Or why is a lamp a symbol for us? Light. The light makes the way. Light. Yeah. So so a lamp. Uh, oftentimes in the uh, uh, Middle East, it might be even shaped like this, where you have your oil in there. And you have a uh, wick that goes down, and you light it, right? So, <coughs> so we uh, right, this uh, reminds us of oh, and it might have a handle on it. So, excuse my crude artwork, but uh, there you go, pretty basic lamp, right? So, um, and basically our candles that we use in church are just the same kind of thing, just. A container uh, for the oil or the fuel, and then a wick that goes down, and we burn the wick, right? So, uh, so this reminds us of uh, from Psalm uh, 119, and I forget the uh, exact verse number there, but uh, Thy word is a lamp to my feet. I I use Thy because you know we sing it in the song that way, right? right? <laughs> Thy word is a lamp to my feet. Yeah, and a light to my path. And uh, and that's a, uh, I should put, and a light to my path. And a light to my path. There. I, I had to write. I had to write it all out the second part too because this shows the parallelism in Hebrew poetry, which I, I have to just take a little aside for a minute there. But in uh, Hebrew poetry, they often say the same thing twice, but in slightly different words uh, for emphasis. So a lamp is. You can see that it's clearly a parallel to light. Light means the the same thing basically. And my feet. Uh, not just we're not just you know shining a, a flashlight on our feet. That's not the point. But it's where my feet go. It means my path. And of course here, a feet and path are both uh, a metaphor. What uh, what do we mean by feet or path? Why, why, what's that? A direction. Walk, yeah. Walking. Okay. A direction that we go and our walking. walking. Jesus. Yeah, or walk. And so walking is another metaphor used kind of along the same idea. It's how I live my life, right? Mm -hmm. The actions that I do, everything. I mean, even what I say, even what I think is all guided by God's Word. You know what this is talking about. And Psalm 119 is the longest chapter of the Bible because it uh, is a meditation for us on how God's word and his laws and commands are a guide for every how we live our lives, our life in him. So this symbol, this symbol, is this was this a symbol and this is a Christian symbol? Yeah. Was it a symbol of was that a Jewish symbol too? Yeah, the Jews also would use this. Probably because of the same uh, thing. So uh, Psalm 119 is expressing mm -hmm. a truth that uh, it comes out in other places in the Psalms and other mm -hmm. things, but it's just the very a metaphor of, uh, you know, another uh, Psalm is, The Lord is my light. The Lord, in all capital letters, as in Yahweh, is my light. And my salvation. Yeah, and my salvation, my light to my salvation. And so light 
from the very first chapter of the Bible, where God says, let there be light, uh, it represents God's action in the world, God's revealing of himself and his love for us. Uh, by light we see, by light do we have life. You know, the, um, John 8, 12, I am the light of the world, Jesus says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, this kind of uh, language here, but will have the light of life, the light which is our life, because we all know if the sun were to uh, stop uh, shining, if the sun were to explode today, uh, life on this planet would uh, probably not last more than uh, a few days before we'd all run out of fuel or energy resources and freeze to death and die, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, and light, of course, all the plants, uh, their green color converting, uh, scientifically speaking, converting that light energy into uh, into sugar, into food, and then that becomes food for us. And so converting the light from the sun into food, the light becomes our food too, you know, another source of our uh, our sustenance and of course then we can take trees and we can burn them for fuel or the trees uh, are cut down or fall down and decompose and eventually become uh, coal in the ground or something like that so it's all you know that's why we call them fossil fuels but it's so our fuel also is really just sunlight converted into uh, first into plant uh, matter and then into coal and so on so but anyway the whole point is that uh, the, the energy from the sun is well God put it there for our life but that light is uh, is our very life and God God is uh, our light that's why I, I can't understand how I mean I guess we know how we know how Satan takes people and draws them away from the Lord how can you be a scientist and be an atheist? Or how can you be an uh, oh, yeah. astronomer and be an atheist when you can look into all these different galaxies and there's nothing? And then you have ours with our little Earth, with all of us here and the plants oh, and the yeah. animals and the people. And how can they not realize that that was, had to be made by a creator? And they, and they can't find any other planet, although no. there are, I mean, there, there are millions, billions, probably trillions of planets uh, like ours in the universe and yet uh, they haven't been able to find one with life like us, right. you know, human I know. beings. I know. You know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, another uh, idea that the lamp uh, brings out, and we brought this out with uh, number five with the candles, like uh, we use in church, but the uh, a different color here. So this is also our, our God's Word uh, showing up, revealing things to us in our life and being a lamp to our uh, feet and so on is uh, by the work of His Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so the lamp becomes a symbol for the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, God at work in our lives. And so that's what the candles represented and why we often use them in sets of seven because God's Holy Spirit is pictured in the scriptures as the sevenfold uh, Spirit of God. Sevenfold just in his, the mystery of His uh, being. Somehow the Holy Spirit is sevenfold or, or even in Revelation John says the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. It doesn't mean there are seven Holy Spirits. I think he's talking about that it's seven, the sevenfold spirit of God. But how, how the Holy Spirit is seven, that's a mystery to us. Can't, can't explain it, but God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit himself or itself is seven. Uh, it's a mystery. <laughs> Okay, so those are some things that the uh, lamp reminds us of. And of course, Jesus uh, told some uh, parables uh, regarding or using lamps. Can you think of a teaching of Jesus that involved a lamp? 
The lamp is that I am the light, the way, the life. Okay, so Jesus saying, I am the light to the world. And also, you are the light of the world. Was that one with the, the lamp? They covered the lamp? That was a parable about yeah. covering the lamp. That's the same one in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Uh, what you do with a lamp is you put it on a lampstand so it gives light to the whole house. And nobody covers it over with a bushel, you know, basket. I mean, that, that uh, doesn't make any sense to... Uh, now, of course, we put, I, I'm looking at a lamp right over there. It's got a bushel over the top, but it's a... Uh, translucent light. It's a lampshade, right? So it's not to obscure the light, but just to soften and spread it more evenly. But I guess you have an emergency vehicle with the right emergency lights flashing. You wouldn't want to cover those things up, would you? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of pointless to uh, to light a light and then cover it up and obscure it. So Matthew, uh, Matthew six. Uh, what? Well, in John, uh, John chapter eight is where Jesus is talking about I am the light of the world, and he talks quite a bit about that because uh, this is uh, in response after uh, Jesus uh, in connection with the healing that he gave sight to a blind man, and now Jesus is saying I am the one who gives you sight and shows you what you couldn't uh, otherwise know. Well, this is well, this isn't why I think this is another one, but you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Yeah. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, so they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the whole point is the light needs to shine mm -hmm. to do its job, to do its work. Yeah. And so that would that come back to us too, that if we're leading God's life, People should be able to look at us and know and see. Yeah, feel, exactly. You know. yeah, exactly. That's so we become that. We are a reflection of that. We are a light, even as God's word is a light for us, and we become a light to others. That's for our neighbor. Yeah. 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 And of course, we say the Lord is my light. That's how. That's why. That's how I can be a light. Is because the Lord is my light, and I'm simply uh, reflecting His light or something. All right, and uh, I also think of when uh, Jesus tells the parable of the ten uh, virgins, the five uh, wise ones and the five foolish ones, who didn't bring oil for their lamp. So really this is a uh, talking about the oil in the lamp uh, more than uh, the lamp itself. But Jesus is talking about being prepared for his coming, and we are prepared when we keep our lamps uh, trimmed and burning. Thinking of the uh, African American spiritual, keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> but it mean, and that's uh, that uh, spiritual is for the purpose of reminding the people, all of us, that we need to be prepared and watchful for Jesus's coming, and to be doing the work that He's given us to do uh, here on earth. That's the point. Okay, uh, number 12 is a good one, one of my favorites. So, so what's this uh, symbol here? Yeah. It's a star of David. Yeah, so, so uh, it, it uh, came to be uh, used, uh, I mean, in, this, in the last century alone, especially to identify the Jewish uh, people. But it, this symbol has a history long before, you know, uh, the uh, Nazis were using it to identify Jews because it was already a prominent symbol in their faith. Uh, this is also called the Star of David, and we'll talk about uh, why that is as well. And so one of the, uh, one, of, one of the students at school in recent years, uh, when David Seiler was here, I, I was teaching him, hey, you know, this is a Star of David. If you wanted to just put on your school papers, uh, instead of writing out the name David, you could just put this. Uh, and I bet Mr. Sattler would know uh, that that means David, you know. And, and he 
he's like, oh cool, I could just use a symbol for my name. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Settler would know that it's David. <laughs> but, but anyway, so uh, star, star of David, uh, in, uh, in, Ger in the German they'd say Mogen Dawid, uh, Star of David. Uh, but anyway, what this is, uh, and here's the reason why it is the Star of David. I need to draw it a little bit bigger here. It's actually, <clears throat> oops, that's, that's not equilateral here. Okay. So if we put numbers on here, one, two, three, four, five, six, I could have drawn it even bigger. I'm just not doing very well today here. Let's draw it bigger so the uh, online people can see. Better. Okay, one, two, three, four, oops, five, six. So I have to test your uh, knowledge here. What does the number six uh, represent throughout the scriptures? Here, let's see if you remember. Six days of creation. Yeah, I was going to say, what's the first set of six that appears in the Bible? God creates uh, all the world in six seventh day he rests okay so seven is really sort of a in the middle uh, kind of number but the star has six point there are six uh, days of the creation and uh, this can help us remember by the way this was really uh, the the star the star of the creator um, or creation the star of the creator or creation because this uh, can remind us of how God uh, created things. So what you might have to turn to Genesis chapter 1 um, to remember this, but if you remember from memory, what did God create on uh, the first day of creation? What's that? Light. Yeah, the first thing he said is, let there be light. And of course then by... Uh, Default. I'll say by default that darkness uh, was a thing because where you don't have light, you got darkness, right? So darkness is the default, and light is the gift from God. So light and darkness. Uh, on the, we're gonna skip that. Well, actually, let's just continue around. So you might have to turn to Genesis one, but what did he create on day two? to uh, you know, look at Genesis 1 anyway. You could guess, but I would just make this. <laughs> so we'll say, uh, okay, so the first pair, so the editors here have divided it up neatly into paragraphs for us. So uh, the first paragraph is light and the darkness. And then what's the... Uh, waters. Yeah. So, so there's the waters. Now what's the... God is going to make a division here and create two things. What are they? Uh, not dry land yet, actually, but uh, at this point, it is the sky. Um, so the sky is the uh, sort of, Moses uses this word for a dome or a, a, a firmament. Uh, let's see. So. So there are different uh, English translations. Dome, a firmament. Uh, is that what, what's the word uh, here? And uh, let's see. Let there be an expanse. Okay, expanse. Okay. So you can think of it just like a uh, when you have a dome on a uh, stadium or something like that, right? Uh, like when the Brewer Stadium, when they close their dome, okay? Uh, it's this dome, and so we're picturing, if you're down on the field or in the bleachers, whatever, and you're under the dome, what does it look like? Uh, you know, what does the sky look like? Well, it looks like a big dome over us, right? It's, uh, we could call it the uh, atmosphere, Scientifically speaking, atmosphere, right? That's uh, 
That's what uh, Moses is talking about here. And this separates, uh, they picture, the, the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew pic, uh, people pictured that there were waters above, and it is sort of like through holes in the dome that uh, that's what rain becomes when you, when you, God opens up the little holes in the dome and then the rain falls down, right? Turn, up, turn on the sprinklers, God, right? The sprinklers up in the dome, okay? And that's how you get rain. Uh, so there's the sky, but there's also the sea. Uh, the sky and, I'll put it here, the sea. And so he says, this dome, this firmament, this expanse thing, uh, the atmosphere divides the waters from up above from the waters down below. In other words, we might just say, and, and by the way, the Hebrews call everything above the surface of the earth skies or heavens. Okay? Heavens means every, this, this is heavens right here. I'm, I'm touching heavens. I can bend down and touch heavens because it's, it means the air and everything above uh, the surface of the earth is heavens. And we know this because he's going to talk about uh, God is going to create birds to fly through the heavens. And, and we say, well, birds don't fly through the heavens. They just fly in the sky. Well, exactly. That's what he's talking about, sky. But he also says God put the stars and planets and everything in the, uh, in the heavens. Well, we, we wouldn't say heavens. We'd say out in space, right? Uh, well, space, heavens also means space. So in other words, it means everything outside of the earth, the surface of the earth, you know, beyond the surface of the earth. So that's what it's talking about there, the sky and the sea, and God separated. So you have, basically, you got the earth, and you got everything else. That's what it's talking about here. And the atmosphere belongs with outer space, inner space and outer space, we might say, right? Okay, so uh, so keep uh, those things in mind. Uh, on day three, what does God create? Yeah, so now he's going to take the surface of the earth and he's going to separate the sea and dry land and make them two different things. Okay, so sea and dry land. And we say dry land because we know there's land underneath the uh, the water uh, of the ocean. There's still land there too. But anyway, so sea and dry land. Okay, so now, uh, what I want to draw your attention to is, notice that number one here, day one, this point is opposite. You can draw this uh, dotted line from one to four, between one and four. So one and four are opposite each other, and those are going to go together, are, are going to correspond. So what does God create on day four? Light, light, the sun breathe the expanse of sky from day to day. Okay, so, so, so lights, which are, so the lights are the, the sun and the moon and the stars, right? So, so this is, uh, what God creates here are not just, this is light in general. He's creating the thing we call light. Uh, th these are the lights, which, which, by which uh, Moses means the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay. So see how those correspond uh, to light and darkness. Uh, these are the lights he creates on, the, uh, on day four. Okay, now... Uh, so just like uh, two, just like uh, on a die, when you roll a die, I think they designed uh, a traditional die wrong because if you played enough uh, games with dice, you know, one and six are on opposite sides and two and five and three and four. It should have been this way. They should have designed it so one and four were on the uh, opposite sides. But, but anyway, that's uh, neither here nor there. But here in this, uh, two and five go together. So what does he create on day five? Little creatures, birds, fish in the sea. Okay, so uh, birds uh, that fly in the sky and uh, fish 
or all kinds of sea creatures that are in the sea. So see how those go together? Uh, he creates creatures to inhabit these new spaces, sky and sea. Birds in the sky, fish in the sea. All right, so he's filling up with uh, the things. Okay, and then uh, on day six, that goes, uh, corresponds to day three. And uh, so what does he create on day six? Living creatures. Okay, so, so all kinds of land uh, creatures, including the most uh, important one of humanity, uh, the most important of the land creatures. But here, notice the sea already exists. On day three, there was already a sea, but dry land is the significant creation on day three, right? To separate it out as something different than the sea. And uh, now he's filling that land with creatures on day six. Okay. So this, all of this, uh, and then of course on the seventh day God rested. And so this is why this star reminds us of God's uh, creation. The six points remind us of that. And uh, of course uh, John says in Revelation, six is the number of man, because man was created on uh, the sixth day. So six also represents man or humanity. Yeah, where are you? Oh, that's interesting. I never realized this, but on the what the second day he created the vegetation. But he created the vegetation before he created the lights. So the lights oh, would yeah. that be the sun and the lights. Yeah. So the so vegetation on, had to have been only on, seeds. On the second day he created the vegetation? Yeah. Or? Yeah. yeah. Here's the vegetation the lights. Oh, that was that was on uh, one, two, three, on uh, the third day uh, oh, the vegetation. So, so yeah, he uh, vegetation. But he created it vegetation comes before the, before light. the sun. The light. Yeah, before, before sun. God uh, created the sun, which is interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. And How could the vegetation even live? Well, please. He still had the general light on. Um, on top, number one, he had the general light, and then it looks to me like he created the light, and then here's the sources. The, the light's coming from the sun. Yeah, no, so there is such a thing as light here, that, yeah. uh, but, then, but maybe he's just lighting up everything in general by his own, like we uh, read in Revelation uh, 21. Uh, we don't, in the new uh, Jerusalem, in the new heavens and earth, we don't need a sun or moon or stars or any of these things because God is the light uh, for all of his creation and revelation. And so maybe God is just the light for all these things at this point. But now he says, nope, I'm going to uh, create specific lights that will be the light for these things. So it talks about the sea-bearing plants and trees. I wonder if he just sent the seed down, and then, so the seeds all are all that are could, placed, Yeah, that could be. God comes the day after. God could have just, starts yeah, growing. God could have just planted seeds. Yeah, yeah, but the which, seeds can't produce anything without the light. Yeah. I never realized that. So, so the, so that's very interesting, and that, that's a very good point, is that the vegetation, so all the plants and trees and everything uh, is there, they, are going to come to depend on the sun and the moon and stars, but they're direct creatures of God, the Creator, the plants and trees and everything. And we can properly call them creatures because they're living things, right? The tree is a living thing. Right. It's a creature of God. Right. Just because we think of creatures as walking around and talking and, uh, and, and whatever doesn't mean that a tree isn't a creature. It doesn't walk around and it doesn't talk, but that's not what it means. A creature just means created a living being of God. And that's why with even uh, you know even all this creation is together together with us praises uh, God our maker, even the plants and trees, as well as the birds and the fish and everything and all the land creatures, we all praise God who created us. Uh, but for now, the vegetation depends on the light from the sun and the moon and the stars. But I'm thinking maybe 
You know, in the new creation, when God makes everything new, and we don't need the sun anymore because the Lord is our light, then maybe the plants and trees will just grow because of God. God is the light. God gives them the growth. You know, so the sun is really sun, moon, and stars are just sort of a provisional thing right now. You know, while uh, God says, and I'm giving them. Oh, by the way, this is also significant. They will be signs uh, to mark the times. Okay, so so signs uh, to mark the times and the seasons. And uh, if if anybody here is participating or watching the Daniel uh, Bible study as well, these times and seasons that the uh, the sun, moon, and stars are marking out. That that means this is God's God's own order of creation that He's established. This is the way God set up things to be. And time, and I think day four is when really time becomes a thing, the ticking of the clock. Now maybe uh, this is when God made clocks a thing, whereas before, well, of course, Moses uses the word. There was uh, evening and morning the first day, evening and morning, evening and morning. But now God is really officially establishing, okay, time is going to be a thing. And you're going to have the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. And that's how you're going to mark times. And you're going to have the phases of the moon. And this is how you're going to mark times and seasons. And so our word a month, actually the M-O-N of month comes from moon. It means a moon cycle, you know. Roughly, and of course, you know, a month, a month. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, of course, it's, you know, is it 29 days, 30, 31, whatever. I mean, but uh, you get the idea that uh, that it's basically roughly a moon, uh, a moon cycle is a month. You know, so. But anyway, so these are God's uh, signs of that I I made this creation. I'm in control of all of it, and these are my servants that are going to kind of mark and govern how time is going to run in this world. So. <clears throat> but, the, again, these aren't needed when we're going to be outside of time. In the new creation, time won't be needed. We'll be in eternity then. And then, of course, the trees and the plants and all the vegetation can live uh, without a need for time or, or the sun. Anyway, that's I'm kind of guess these are educated biblical guesses that I mean the Bible doesn't specifically say these things, but you know as I'm talking about these things here, you're, you're like yeah that actually kind of makes sense if you if you think about all this. So so this is what we do is well the Bible doesn't maybe necessarily spell out every detail for some things, but it's like well if this is true. If the vegetation came before the sun, then uh, it can it can exist apart from the sun. That's the uh, idea there. So. Okay, so the star of the creator. Oh, uh, now uh, how did this? I, I promised you I would say uh, or I'd explain. Well, what does this have to do with David then? This is, uh, oh, I should know from memory here, but now I forget. God connects his uh, covenant with David. Uh, his covenant with David is, I will bless you and your descendant will uh, rule on your throne forever and ever. Remember that promise uh, to David? That uh, your, your descendant, your seed is going to rule forever and ever uh, on, your, on the throne of David, which means rule over God's kingdom forever and ever. And that's the promise. And we know that Jesus, that's why Jesus is called the son of David. He is that descendant who will rule on God's eternal throne. Uh, this is what it's talking about in Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Uh, that means God's, you know, ruling over God's creation. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Um, so, uh, and God says, as long as 
the sun and the moon and the stars, as long as they're governing everything, uh, in other words, as long as they're governing the creation and marking out all these times and seasons, then uh, they are, uh, there's always going to be, as long as the sun rises and the sun sets, then my, that's going to confirm my promises to David that I'm going to accomplish the salvation of the world. And, uh, oh, by the way, this is part of the God's covenant with Noah as well. I put my rainbow in the sky to show that as long as the sun rises and sets and all these things are still happening, the uh, order that I have established for creation, then you can know that I am still in control and I love my creation and I will always take care of it and I'm never going to send a flood again like that. Uh, but he also connects it to the covenant with David to say, uh, as long as the as this uh, creation uh, still is, I'm the I'm the creator of all this creation, and as long as everything holds together the way I designed it, then you can know for certain that my promises to David are also sure. And so uh, the the creation and the creator connects himself intimately with with David to say David and his uh, descendant, his family line is what I'm going to bless. And that's uh, where salvation is going to come from. Right, does all that make sense? There. So, so that's why uh, the star of David becomes uh, the, the star of the creator becomes the star of David and later becomes the star to identify the Jews who believe all this stuff put together with us. So. Okay, uh, we only have we only have ten minutes left, and I thought, well, maybe we'd uh, get all these finished, but sometimes the pastor talks too long. <laughs> okay, uh, number thirteen. What is a hand uh, coming down out of clouds, you might say, or even just coming from above? What does that remind us of? In a sense, yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> this is God, God reaching down uh, to His creation to help and to say, but, but the Holy Spirit, you know, you're not wrong. I can't say you're wrong. <laughs> right? That's what she does crossword puzzles. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, she cheats. She <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is God's hand reaching down. And so whenever you have a hand reaching down, that is God reaching down to help and save and rescue us. Now this particular hand, as uh, in the in the old uh, German style, the Germans always start when they count. Uh, they always start with the thumb. We in our society, at least I was always taught, taught we we start with our index finger one, two, three, four, five, like that. The Germans always start. Uh, with the, at least the old traditional way, they always start with the thumb. One, two, three, four, five. If you go like that. Is that where the <clears throat> signal comes up, like thumbs up? Is that where that comes uh, from? That could be. Meaning like this is Something. the first thing or an important thing. thing. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not sure of that connection. But <laughs> we, uh, when we uh, went to uh, Germany back in uh, 1990 with our college choir and we were over there six weeks, and, uh, but they said, if you go into a pub or something and you want to order a beer, uh, you don't say, Ein, Ein beer. Uh, they might not hear the Ein part. They're going to see your finger. And to them, that's the second finger. So they're going to bring you two. If you hold up this finger, they're going to bring you two beers. Uh, you say, Ein, Ein beer. You know, one beer. Uh, if you do this, you're going to get two beers. <laughs> If you do this, well, of course, in our society, you hold up the middle finger, that's a bad thing. But, I mean, they would say, oh, that's number three, you know, or something. But, but anyway, uh, and, and it's awkward. To, so, so basically, but if you want a three, you'd go like this. Yeah. Of course, I, I played uh, baseball when I was younger, and I was a catcher. And, uh, and we'd always like, okay. Well, when you uh, want to make signs to all the rest of the guys, catcher is kind of a leader, and to say, hey guys, just a reminder, two outs, two outs, we, we go like this, and not, 
not because I'm from Texas, but because that's easier to see by the center fielder who's way out there far away from me. If you go like this, yeah. he might not, that might only look like one finger. Yeah. You separate them out, it's easier to tell those two fingers. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. I could have gone like this because that's pretty uh, obvious. That's two and not just one. Yeah. But that, that's uh, what I thought of. But, <clears throat> but anyway, the point is, uh, so this, so how many uh, fingers is this hand holding up then? In the, in the old German style, this is the three uh, fingers for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So see, you weren't wrong, Larry. You said Holy Spirit, but you only got a third of the, that's only a third of the answer there. This is actually Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is reaching down to help and to save and to bless. And that's why, uh, watch me in church when I, you know, make the, the uh, sign of blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. It's always with the three fingers, uh, and of course, then I was uh, taught when we uh, when we make the sign of the cross, and I always do this. It's uh, three three fingers, and you go like this with these three fingers to make the sign of the cross: Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, or 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 you can or you can just go like that. But if you stick the thumb up, you're not folding it down. You you stick it up to be three fingers. You know. Like this or something. Gee, when we stood in the military, we, we used these three because the two were on your forehead and the one came down to, as a oh, location. Okay. You know, and you above your eyes, that thumb would come down as, as a location. So that there you are right there, there's three. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know in the Where Army. <laughs> I know in the army, or at least nowadays, they use the whole, the full, uh, all five okay. fingers. You know, you need to yeah. Touch the uh, the tip of your eyebrow there. I can't, yeah. I've got my glasses there, but you know, right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can't have your palm showing, not like that. It's got to be tilted down because that's the sign of respect, but, you know, of honor, and respect. Mm -hmm. Okay, number fourteen. Uh, just a couple minutes left, but I'm uh, mindful that Steve and Donna have to go. So we have a shell and three drops of water. I think you know what that one is. Yeah, yeah baptism. That's easy. And why uh, three drops of water? <laughs> same, same reason three fingers in the last one, right? Uh, whenever we have uh, a set of three, it reminds us of the Trinity. And so Father, the Father is the one who... Uh, sent his son Jesus and uh, adopts us as his children. The son, is, Jesus, is the one who connects himself to us and he takes our sin away. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is active in this baptism to now connect you to Jesus and to keep you in the faith uh, all your life. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who, we say, is the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son with the Father and the Son together as worshipped and glorified as spoke by the prophets. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, number 15, maybe we will get uh, through these all real quick here, because uh, number 15 is pretty easy. What, what's going on there? Yeah, communion. So you have the bread and the wine. Uh, the bread is usually in a wafer for convenience because, you know, the, we could have a loaf of bread and be breaking off pieces and then you drop crumbs everywhere. I'm speaking from experience because I'm a messy person, but uh, yeah, you could uh, have one loaf of bread and that would be symbolic because, you know, Paul talks about, don't we all eat of one loaf? Well, for convenience we use the little crackers, so to speak, the little wafers, but it's still bread. I mean, it's basically just wheat and water are the uh, only two ingredients of uh, our wafers that we use. Uh, but anyway, the point is that it's, uh, it's Christ's body and blood uh, given for us and shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, number 16. Glad we got to this one because this you're going to see this uh, very symbol on the front cover of our bulletin this weekend. I gave you a preview there. So you're, you're privileged. you got the privilege to preview there. You'll see this exact symbol. And uh, yeah, on the front cover of your bulletin, it won't be colored uh, the way well, some of you have colored uh, copies and some of us have black and white. So what uh, what is that symbol there? 
Yeah, so in the middle is Luther seal. And he said, I designed it uh, to be a rose on the outside, uh, a white rose to represent the purity. And, uh, and, the, uh, and Jesus is called the rose of Sharon, the rose of Sharon in, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures. And, it, and, uh, he, and the white color represents his holiness, his purity. Uh, but in the middle is the heart, a human heart, our heart. Uh, and of course it's red uh, because you know, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I mean, besides, blood is red anyway and hearts are red. But it's the blood is the emphasis that we're cleansed by Jesus' blood. That's what it reminds us of. And then of course there's a black cross in the middle of the heart because that means death uh, to the sinner in us. But through the cross we get life, life through Jesus and renewal of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And then he said, I put, uh, Luther says, I put a blue sky around the, uh, around the rose because uh, that represents, uh, let's see, how did he put that? Um, yeah, it does kind of represent the creation that he put us in and uh, I can't remember exactly how uh, Luther explained that blue sky, but uh, it does represent that we're in the creation and so on, but around the very out, around the outside the blue, he put a gold ring. Is it gold on this one? Uh, well, in here it's expanded on uh, on this picture, the gold, so that you could put the words uh, grace alone, faith alone, scripture or word alone in there. But Luther said the gold represents uh, heaven. The gold ring is God's uh, promise to us. You know, just like a wedding ring and uh, the promise of the glory and uh, eternal life with him in heaven. And so that's why Luther seal always properly has a gold ring around the outside. Uh, we added uh, to that these great, uh, this great, three great uh, slogans of the, uh, of the Reformation, that we are saved by grace alone, which is at the bottom, uh, through faith alone, and we learn this by God's word alone, or scripture alone. And these all teach us that salvation is by, this could be a fourth one, we might add Christ alone is our uh, salvation. Christ alone, um, by grace, through faith, uh, by the power of the word alone. Christ is the word. Yeah, Christ is the word, so word alone could be understood as Christ alone as well. So. And faith alone only in Jesus. Yeah, and faith only in Jesus. That's right. Yeah. That's what saves us. So. so that was, this was created by Martin Luther? Yeah, so Luther is the one who came up with that rose, mm -hmm. and uh, which is also called a messianic rose, by the way. It represents God's uh, promise of a savior in the scriptures. So on. And that's why he chose that to say, it's got to be about Christ. He's the Messiah, and he is the one who fulfills the scriptures. And so he chose that white rose uh, to be more a white flower to represent that he is that uh, promise of God fulfilled. So. Beautiful symbol. All right. Yeah, so lots of great symbols, just ways that expressions of our faith that uh, teaching us even... Oh yeah, there's Luther's seal uh, right there on the cross, and, yeah. and of course some uh, add the uh, these almost these dark parts almost look like arrows pointing outward uh, to uh, the dark arrows coming out from the cross in the heart, and so on, uh, as if like he's now sending us out into all the world. So. All right, well let's close with prayer. We thank you, God, for blessing us with this time as we study the, the many uh, teachings uh, from the scriptures, the many uh, symbols of our faith, and the many things that we uh, believe in as you have taught us from your word. And we pray that you would help us to be strengthened in the faith, help us to cling ever more firmly to Christ our Savior, and uh, to celebrate the truth that you give us and the life that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody.